Okay, we can start the live stream now. We're going to get started in about 30 seconds. Are we good? Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Concordia University's fourth space. And thank you for joining us for today's event, Prototyping for Game Design with Behavior Interactive. And to help situate you, we are streaming to YouTube live from Four Space, and we are located on unceded Indigenous lands in Chichage, Montreal. Here at Four Space, we work with the university community to help mobilize knowledge, co-create daily activities, examine research questions across the university. Today, we're running this event as a live stream Zoom meeting also, and we definitely welcome all comments and questions uh, in the chat if you're joining us there. Those of you in the space, when we get to the Q&A, just raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you th so that everyone can hear. And that's with that, it's very much my pleasure now to hand this over to Associate Professor in Design and Computation Arts, but also the Behavior Interactive Research Chair in Game Design, Jonathan Lassard. Jonathan, welcome. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Bonjour tout le monde. Merci de venir au premier événement organisé par la chaire de recherche en game design, Behavior Interactive. So for those who don't know, Behavior Interactive, with representatives here, uh, donated $2 million to Concordia to found a research chair in game design. So that's pretty nice. Thank you, Behavior. And on top of that, not, they were not happy to only give uh, make a donation but also showed some real strong and uh, genuine willingness to do stuff with us and co-organize things so this is the first one uh, we put this together in the past weeks thanks in part also to my colleague pippin Barr, who couldn't be there today and uh, we have a pretty i think really spot on uh, topic to get started with prototyping very important aspect of game design and also often the moment where even people who don't situate themselves in the research field are actually doing research by trying new stuff and uh, figuring out what works. So this is the, the topic that we'll be investigating. The, the model is pretty simple. We're four people here. So in order of presentations, I have Alexis Jolie des Hotels uh, from Behavior, creative director. On his right, Rila Khaled, my esteemed colleague, professor of computation arts, uh, game design as well. Sophie uh, Lamont-Cardinal, who is a team lead and senior game designer at Behavior Interactive. And Danny here will be doing the moderation in the second half of this event, uh, where we'll be more taking questions and discussing amongst ourselves. He's professor at UCAT, uh, Université du Québec, en Abitibi-Témiscamingue but located in Montreal. So that's it for presentations. And uh, so the, the format is four presentations, roughly 10 minutes to get stuff to talk about and put, put things on the table. And then we move on to uh, questions and discussions. I give my place to Alexi. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having us. And uh, I want to extend my thanks also as a Video game professional, I think I'm supposed to describe myself now, but also a lover of research. And this is not a popular opinion in my field. <laughs> people doing games don't like to waste their time reading stuff and talking to people. I mean, it's not true, but mostly, mostly true. Uh, but I'm a big uh, lover of research and academia and stuff. So I'm really glad about this uh, cooperation between our two institutions. And I'm super glad to open up because I'll be the most abstract and then you'll get useful stuff from the actual people doing prototyping. So let me just uh, get in focus. In case you're wondering, it's a Mac. And of course, no one in games work on a Mac. So I, I just. I worked. Um, so I've been in games for 20 years. I've been always in design, uh, although I don't get to design as much uh, as I would love to these days. Um, 
and prototype, like I was saying, and research in general has always been really important to me. And so I was really happy. I actually found out that Jonathan, which I'm known from before, is holding the chair. So I'm even more excited now. Uh, he's, he's a cool guy. Um, so I was also very excited because at the office, I, I learned that we have a new PowerPoint, uh, PowerPoint template, which is the one I'm using today. And I absolutely love PowerPoint as a designer. It's uh, it's actually my favorite program, although it's I think it's kind of shitty, but I really like it. Um, and I was excited to discover the new template. It's full of beautiful colors. Uh, so I figured I would I would go on and explore that in terms of um, how could I make it the most beautiful and exciting presentation for you guys. Uh, so I started with this, and uh, and then I'll see if this is connected or not. If I put it, yeah, maybe. Um, I thought about this title, Prototyping Pearls of Wisdom. And I thought it sounded a bit um, maybe arrogant, but I really stuck to it. I kind of like that title. So I tried the, the, the kind of white font on black first, uh, but I felt it was a bit too like rigid. Uh, so I actually tried the opposite. And then I, I guess I'll just do that. And I went with the other slide, which has warmer colors. And I did black on white. Um, and an animation from the side. Also, and then I, so I was two hours in my work, and I, um, I wondered what am I trying to say really? I, I could there was a lot of slides in that template, so I figured like I'm getting lost. So I actually remembered I needed to figure out like what am I trying to convey here? Why am I building this thing? And I was going for like kind of a cheeky but profound, inspirational. I needed gravitas. I wasn't really not hitting with these slides. So I, uh, I keep trying this in case it works. So then I found this one that says placeholder, insert image. And that's my favorite slide from the template because I love placeholders. Uh, so I had inserted an image. I was looking for something wise. So I went for Pyme, which is the, the wisest cool guy. And, I, and it really hit a note. I was like, if I use strong visual like Pyme, I can really convey humor and wisdom. So I knew I was on, onto something right. I tried more dynamic animations uh, for the title which I ruled out because I think they're, they're really not helping the presentation. So I found my way pretty quickly. I knew what I wanted to say. I knew how I wanted to say to you guys. So I started the work. So here's the actual title slide uh, for the deck. These were, I mean, the discarded ideas. I went for this. Um, and as you can see, I generated this image using the Bing creator thing. Um, which is why it can't spell right almost anything that I told them, but I don't care because I think you, you can all read prototyping pearls of wisdom at the top, even though it's not written that, right? It's good enough. It has gravitas. It's biblical in nature. Everyone gets the reference. Not everyone knows by me. So that was an obstacle for me too. And, um, I stuck with that and I generated just a bunch of images to talk to you guys. So I just want to share a few quote unquote pearls of wisdom about prototyping from a design perspective and even uh, as a creative director now, these are still things um, that I get to, to worry about very often, even though I'm not designing the stuff per se. So the first point, the most critical, is this. And actually this one, is, it's spelled properly, I think. Thou shalt only prototype to find an answer. And this seems obvious, but I cannot tell you how this never happens. <laughs> you will sit down and you will go like, oh, I know, I know, I know, I know. And then you'll bu build a prototype. And mostly you'll be prototyping because things are cool. And that is the worst reason to prototype. Actually, it's the worst reason to do anything at all, especially in design. If you design stuff because it's cool, I mean, you're fired. You, you, you get the idea. So the first thing you need to do is figure out why you need something first. Again, very obvious, very hard to come up with. You're building a game. There's You have a feature list. You know, it's going to be a, a game with cowboys and horses, and it's going to be like shooting. So you know the stuff that's gonna be in there, but you don't know why it's in there. So instead of saying, oh, I know, let's build a prototype about horse, horses and lassos, you need to wonder why do we have horses? And a bit like me, when I started with my template, what is it I'm trying to say with this system ultimately? And then I'm figuring out the big why of everything I put in the game, which is the first thing I need to do to design actually anything, but especially for prototyping, which means that I design with intention. So I say, well, I wanna do, a presentation that conveys gravitas, I need to design a way to come up with cool images of biblical nature. And then you have your questions set out for you. You have your course and your journey set out for you. So you take that, you formulate the idea into a question. So not let's do this because it's cool. 
but more like, is this bringing the gravitas I need in PowerPoint? And then you go out and prototype it. So never design without intention and never spend anyone's time with prototypes without intention. It's criminal. Like the budgets are out of control. We don't have time for people to just throw shit on the wall and see if it sticks, pardon my French. I'm, yeah, I'm a Francophone by the way, so I may use like bad language from time to time and it's because I'm not good in English. The second thing I wanna talk about is this, resist the sunk cost fallacy. Now for those that are not familiar with the sunk cost fallacy, it's illustrated here basically. And another way to say it is this, the effort you put into something does not change its value. It means it may be crap, even though it was the longest thing you prototype. It took you weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and you generated hundreds of images. It wasn't good, it just wasn't good. They're not more valuable because you took six weeks. The opposite is also true. These images are not less valuable because I generated them in 30 seconds. They're doing what I need them to do. They're conveying humor and gravitas about prototyping. The image here is uh, someone with very noble intentions, still trying to get out with everything. And uh, that's, that's how the devil gets you, basically. So time box the effort before you start. Always time box the effort. People get lost in prototypes. If you're on a big project with infinite money, you are doomed. You'll be living in proto limbo land for like eight months and you don't even remember where you started. And you're actually down that hole trying to find every piece of gold that is uh, laying there. So always time box the effort because you already have the question. So I need to find, I need to figure out this thing. We're gonna allow ourselves ourselves such amount of hours or days and we're gonna accept the results. And then we can reassess, but it needs to stop. Okay, especially you have a lot of free times, free time on your hand, maybe your students, I mean, most of you, so you got loads of free time. You're gonna be prototyping nonstop into the night and you're gonna die uh, out of prototyping basically, which happens. And basically what I'm trying to say, the more you carry, the, the faster you sink. This is what you should remember. If you left with all the gold, you won't make it across the river. So that's why you need to time box and don't hoard prototypes and stuff you wanna try, you can hoard it and hoard it and then you die. I'm not kidding. Third thing, which leads me to this. Prototypes are disposable experiments. Um, I guess a bit like children. I don't know. I mean, this, I'm gonna blame the AI generation here, of course, but my prompt was very precise. Um, I guess my point is this. Oh, and actually just so you, the system refused to give me the images, I had to reword because I was asking for a young mother throwing a baby into the river and it would not generate it. I was surprised. I was pleasantly surprised. So I had to say a woman smiling, there is also a, a children like a baby falling in the river and they did this. Um, do not get attached to the result. It, it's a bit of a follow-up to the previous point, but it's really important. Maybe you did something really cool. Maybe you actually made an amazing discovery and it took you a lot, a lot of time. So you're putting the sunk cost fallacy mixed with your personal preference. And then you're like, no, nah, this is too good. I need to put it in the game. I knew a designer that spent three consecutive AAA games trying to do diegetic weapon HUD. You know what I'm saying? Like, no, it's on the backpack. It's on the gun. It's on the gun and the backpack. There's a reflection. There's a laser in front of him with the ammo count. For three games, he tried to shovel this diegetic design because it was just too good to let go. But these were three projects where it didn't make sense. It was just crap. And you had to tell him, let it go, man. And he prototyped and he did mock-ups and it's like for hours and hours and hours. So I, I, I didn't have the image back then. I wish I did. I was like, this is your idea right now. It needs to go in the river. <laughs> if you found your answer, whether it's yes, no, toaster, love it, focus on how it could be done properly. That's also important, of course, which means you haven't done it properly. You're not supposed to do it properly. It's a prototype. It's meant to be thrown in the river. It's like your firstborn, it's kind of ugly. You're like, eh. throw it in the river, try again, or ask someone how to do it properly. So let the experts in. And I'm saying this because nowadays, like I was lucky enough that I, I grew in design without being technically trained. Uh, and that was my chance. So I couldn't do shit on my own. Uh, I could do stuff on napkins and in PowerPoint, but I couldn't do uh, um, really anything else. 
And I, I think nowadays I see we hire people that come in and they have a lot of, of proficiencies in different fields, which is a risk because it means you think you can do it. Yeah, you can, maybe you can prototype, so that's great. But throw it away, trash it, and let the experts take it. So what's important for people you're gonna work with is not how you did it. Nobody cares how you did the scrappable prototype. They wanna know what was the question, what was the answer, and what are your takeaways? And then you can tell them, especially if you work closely with a gameplay programmer, you can go, look, this is what I found out. This is the prototype, you can play it. This is what I was looking for. And they'll go like, oh yeah, no, I, I won't do it like that. <laughs> and they'll have the proper way to do it. And you go like, yep, thank you, better baby next time. And that's what you want, right? Okay. This one is, um, this one is easy, but fascinating. So uh, before I display anything, there's a young knight looking for, um, I guess, I don't know, his way home or something, the princess. Should he go left or right? What do you think? <laughs> Anyone? Really? Huh? Left? That is the wrong answer. <laughs> I got you. Of course, it's the wrong answer. My point is this. The fastest route to the question, to the answer to your question is always quick and dirty. That's the mindset of prototyping. So he, he can actually make a deal with the devil there and just teleport back to the castle and sell his soul. Well, he'll, he'll, he'll get there like this. You're prototyping. Um, like I said, we don't care how you do it. Find the quick and dirty, like the quickest route to the, the answer you're looking for. And I mean by this, use napkins. I made a joke, but napkins are a great design tool. They're easy to find. You can design in a restaurant. Amazing. Or, or the paper menus are good too. Um, Legos. I've seen a lot of very serious prototypes done in Legos, like actual, like AAA shooter, cover-based shooter type thing, all done in Lego and actually presenting to clients with Lego boards or animated Lego sequences because it's it's rather quick depending on who you are. My favorite, oh, so you should look up, if you're interested, Michel Gondry, he was an amazing French director. He used to do a lot of um, crazy music videos and he did one for Chemical Brothers called Star Guitar. And it's just like a train, a view from a train and you see the scenery and everything in the scenery is part of the music. It's all like composited. So it goes like, ish, 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 like that. And he prototyped that in an alley, laying out glasses and oranges and shoes on the floor. And he kind of filmed walking backwards. And that was his prototype. He said, yeah, this is going to be great. It was quick and dirty. And I mean, literally, because he left like a lot of junk in the alley, I guess. Um, my favorite quick and dirty prototype I did was testing an AI. So we wanted to improve the AI for cover base shooter like we used to do a lot. Um, and it was very expensive to test that out. And programmers were not available. And like I said, I can't do anything with that. So we just basically wrote all these flashcards with behaviors on them. And we handed it out a bunch of designers and we went in an underground garage and we played the level. So one, one person was the player. So as a player, you're trying to get to the door and everyone else was like, you're terrorist number one, you're a guy with an RPG or whatever it was. And everyone had two or three simple rules if player does this, do that. If player is static, move around. If player is not looking at you, get closer, things like that. And we tested out for hours, just a bunch of you know, kids running in a, in a parking with these little flashcards. And we came back with a solid design that was, it was actually prototyped, it was valid. There's no difference between that and coding something half-baked in the engine directly, right? So that's what I mean, quick and dirty. This is making the deal with the devil right there. Always do it, Legos, I don't know, whatever you have. Um, and I guess lastly, um, King does not like kitten juggling. That was a bit harder to prompt that one, I'll be honest. <laughs> You'll get where I'm going with this. For all that is holy and sacred, never prototype to find the fun. If I hear of you, anyone else watching at home doing that, I will come to your home personally and I will destroy the prototype <laughs> and your computer. You will hear this, this will happen on projects. I don't expect designers to make this mistakes so much, to be honest. It's rare that a designer is like, oh, where's the fun? I'm gonna find the fun. This is not the typical bullshit that comes from our field. It comes from a lot of other directions. People will come to you and go like, okay, but we need to find the fun guys. We need a plan, proto plan. Let's do prototypes, find the fun. You, I don't know if you feel how dangerous the situation is for you, for everyone on the project. You need to be armed with everything I told you before. To go like, okay, yeah, I mean, I, I hear you. Let's let's break it down. What is fun? What do you mean? Who are the players? What are they looking for? What's the vibe? You can go to the creative direction. What are we supposed to do here? 
and you break it down and you come back with something intelligent that you can actually answer to. If you just look for fun, it's the same thing. You're going to be eight months down the road with nothing to show and nowhere to go. And you don't even know where you started. That, that's very scary. Happened a few times. And I'm still PTSD from, from, from that. Um, I said, obviously, we design for fun. I take for granted that in 98% of cases, you will be designing for fun. I'm not talking about your weird art project or your serious game. That's fine. You know what you're doing. In most cases, we design for fun. So actually looking for fun is an oxymoron because you would never prototype a system that is not fun. Right? And this is something you can answer back to those people when they ask you. It's like, of course, everything I do is fun. What's your point? Maybe not like that. Um, so lastly, and to leave you with something, um, this is the most important slide for me. It's a side topic, but boxes and arrows are the divine language. Uh, and I used a lot of strong visual, but no boxes and no arrows. So I wanted to leave you with something. It's very simple. Um, so this is my gift, my, my pearl of wisdom to you. And it's supposed to be written, enjoy this divine bonus, but, but that's what we have, the golden box. And it's this, this is simple. You can take a picture, print it on a t-shirt, uh, bring it home. This is, you don't need anything else as this, right? Think, you start by think. You know why? No, think again. That's the easy part. Happens all the time. Yes, formulate question. Determine quickest route, time box. Then you start. Don't start before that. And if you need answers from other people on the project, go and get them answers. Show them the flowchart and say, I need to know what the, what's the time box, what's the time allowance on this, or the man month, how many, you know, how many guys can I, can I disturb with this thing? Did, did you find the answer to your question? No, start again. Or maybe your question is bad, so revisit the question. Then document the fineness, destroy everything, <laughs> celebrate, sleep, right? So it's kind of, it's actually easy if you look at it that way. <laughs> so that's all the wisdom I couldn't impart on you today without uh, being more ridiculous than this. And um, I thank you for your attention. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Rila Khalid. I'm an associate professor in design and computation arts. And I am also associate director of Techno Culture Art and Games Research Center. I know we have some people from TAG at the back here. Hello. Hi. And I can also see uh, former students of mine sitting in the room, which is very lovely. So here we go. I think it's very funny, actually, that Alexi started talking about black on white, and then also <laughs> white on black. And in fact, I was actually seriously annoyed by your talk because there's a lot of overlap. He got to say the things first. Remember, I said them last. <laughs> All right. So my wigs. I showed my husband my talk and I, I showed him the wig slide and he immediately started grimacing. And I was like, yes, I've got to keep that. So the wig, one of my wigs is uh, my designerly wig, right? Another is my researcher wig. And my third wig, it's my professor wig. Okay, so other people in the group today are gonna to talk about the designer perspective. And later on, I'm gonna talk about my researcher perspective. But for right now, I'm gonna focus on my professorial perspective. And I'm gonna revisit fundamentals of prototyping that have continued to remain true over the last 15 years of my career. So I teach a class called DART 601, Research Methods and Design, which is part of Concordia's Masters of Design program. And every year, our cohort includes students hailing from different design subdisciplines, 
we have architects, we have industrial designers, we have interaction designers, and of course, we have game designers. So every year, we pick up the conversation, what are the qualities of a good prototype? And in true uh, nutty professor form, what I like to do, oh my God, I get the plot synopsis of the nutty professor here on my watch. <laughs> Wonderful. Later, tell us later. <laughs> I am a nutty professor, okay. <laughs> What I have all of the students do is I make everyone come up to the front and throw down their ideas onto a blackboard. So I can see Stephen nodding from the audience because some of his ideas actually made it onto this blackboard. So what we do is we, we get together and as a collective, we work out what we agree on. And this is what we decided we agreed on in terms of qualities of a good prototype. So we'll start with the economic principle of prototyping, which is really just a very, very fancy way of saying quick and dirty. But remember, I'm here to teach you the big words. <laughs> yeah. All right, so the economic principle of prototyping. The best prototype is one that in the simplest and most efficient way makes the possibilities and limitations of a design idea visible and measurable. Okay, quick and dirty. As little effort and resources as possible. When we use digital materials, we frequently slide into the trap of confusing the prototype with the final build. Okay, so the Unity prototype slowly becomes the completed Unity game. And that is one way of doing things, but it is not the only way. And the efficiency to not thinking about the prototype uh, as becoming the final thing is that you're not going to get lost in the weeds trying to build out actual infrastructure. You can focus on the most important details that you have questions about. So if you like, you can think about this as MVP. What is my minimum viable prototype? But this leads to another point. A prototype should be connected to questions. And not just connected to, every prototype should materialize questions. Scientists have the experimental method, form a hypothesis, undertake an experiment and dialogue with that hypothesis, analyze the results, and then see whether that hypothesis is proven or disproven. Designers do the same thing, but our experiment takes the form of answering those questions in material form or realizing them, making them real via prototypes. We have to get our questions out of our heads and into the world via prototypes. These questions might concern whether your design does the thing that you think it does, or perhaps whether other people think that it does the thing that you think it does. And there's no point in prototyping if you can't associate the prototype with a question. And if you can't come up with a question, you'll never know if the prototype provides an answer. But on the topic of questions, not every question is created equally. Some questions are poorly framed, too vague, or too big to be helpful. They start to run into the territory of not even having questions. Because a question that is too big is not going to be answerable by your prototype. The scientific equivalent of this is the non-testable hypothesis. And any scientist will tell you a hypothesis has to be testable. So don't come up with hypotheses that you cannot test. Design is the same. Your prototype 
should be built to be able to answer your question. And don't make the prototype equivalent of asking if God exists, more religious references. <laughs> so now in terms of detail, low fidelity prototypes are ones that do not appear to be in true form. And we can contrast this with high fidelity prototypes that do, to, do appear to be in true form. And this is assuming that we understand fidelity as being related to truth. If you use a high fidelity prototype, this has the effect of signaling that you are nearing the end of the design process. So use these carefully. Okay? When you show a high fidelity prototype to someone who is not on the design team, they're automatically going to assume that you are showing them something that is nearing the end of completion. If I showed a Minecraft mod to represent my non-Minecraft game idea to someone, they might reasonably assume that my final concept will look and feel like Minecraft. And they would have responded very differently if I'd showed, shown them a paper prototype of the same concept. A high fidelity prototype is like a material fact and people generally respect facts so don't make the mistake of pitching a question as if it were a fact. So this segues us to the next point regarding the role of other people. Prototypes function as boundary objects. And a boundary object in academic ease is any object that is part of multiple social worlds and facilitates conversation between them. The social world of a designer is different from the social world of a player or audience member. Your designerly experience of your concepts and your prototypes is going to be different from how your audience experiences the same thing. And we frequently fall into the trap of not testing our prototypes enough with other people. We assume that our eyes and our experience can stand in for their eyes and their experience. But this is not the case. Designers are sullied or reach out to the unsullied because there are lots of them. All right, on the topic of plentitude, from the early stages of prototyping, consider coming up with multiple options, okay? Materialize the most promising ideas, but in MVP resolution. If an idea has to be X, because you know you have other ideas at play, trust me when I say, you'll care a lot less, okay? Because you will have lesser emotional involvement with all of those ideas, with every individual idea. And you'll also have already demonstrated to yourself that you're fully capable of coming up with more ideas. You can love more than one idea and you are capable of producing more than one lovable idea. And that brings me to the end of this this speed run through distilled qualities of good prototypes as agreed upon by multiple generations of practicing designers. For the rest of today's session, I won't only talk about prototyping with respect to my professorial wig, I'll also talk about it with respect to my researcher wig. So you'll hear me talk about an ongoing project that I'm leading together with Pippin Barr, uh, Danny Godin and Zanaton called Games as Research, where our intention is to make game design processes utterly traceable. Game dev projects are frequently very mysterious. In industry contexts, what happens during the process is normally tidied away, tucked away behind NDAs. Within the academic sphere, there's a very mysterious vaporware cloud frequently surrounding game dev projects as well. 
So we want to change that by making all of the materials associated with game making trace traceable and recoverable through archiving them in platforms like GitHub. And these materials can help us establish facts and truths and knowledge about game design practice. That's me for now. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's so Yeah. Oh, sorry. Thanks. Yeah. I think Alex was pressing the wrong button. Uh, <laughs> so, hello everyone. I'm Sophie. I am a lead game designer at Behavior, and I'm here to talk to you about prototyping, obviously. And you may uh, notice this nice uh, template uh, that may or may not have been the same one as Alexi. Uh, but yeah, so you're prototyping. You have a great idea and you say, okay, this is what I wanna test. You have your question ready. You know exactly what you're gonna do. And you go in prototyping. You do all of those gray boxes and you have your fantastic prototype. You show it to player and they are completely lost. You have no idea if your game is bad, your prototype is bad, or if they just don't understand. Generally speaking, if your player doesn't understand your game is the problem, not the player, mark this. But in this case, your problem might be that you're missing signs and feedbacks. So we just talked about the fact that uh, we need prototypes to be quick and dirty. However, sign and feedbacks are still very important for people to simply understand. So what are signs and feedbacks? First off, signs, they're basically the information that you give to the player for them to understand your game. While feedback is anything that allows the player to understand what has already happened. So sign is before something happens, feedback is after. Here are some examples. So signs, this is an exploding barrel. I know it is an exploding barrel before I shoot it because it's red and it has an explosion sign on it. This is the perfect example of a sign. This here is a door that is unlocked. There is the word open on it, it's written in blue. If you've played Dead Space, you'll know that you'll have the exact same door with a red sign on it that's written closed. This here is a Goomba with a spike on its head. If I jump on it, it's gonna hurt me. So feedback, or afterwards, this exploding barrel is on fire. It has just exploded. I understand that I managed to make it explode. Gunshot in the wall. So this is when I shoot, I know my bullet has gone to this. It could be also inside bodies, though usually that's more dead bodies with blood on them. And here we have the uh, earth beat in Dead by Daylight. So I put this example specifically because if you play the PC game, you're only gonna have sound. And feedback is not only visual, it's also sound. It could be tactical, uh, though if you want to have tactical feedback in your prototype, you need to have a very specific questions to answer. Uh, in this case, in the mobile version, we put a visual feedback because most people on mobile don't play with sound. So why do we need those sign and feedback? Why aren't we considering them to be just polished that is useless? So we're gonna look a little bit on, on how human work. So, Human memory. Human memory is made out of three components. The first one is the sensory register. Uh, this is perception. 
So whenever you're looking at a scene, I see people looking at me, I hear people laughing, I hear, these, these are all perception things I'm looking at. These all go in the sensory register. The moment I put attention on this, they go in my working memory. So my working memory is what I'm thinking about at that moment. It's anything I'm being focused on. And from there, we also have the long-term memory, which is everything that I know that is stored in there. It's not like a computer, but that's the best way to think about it. So working memory is both things that we perceive at that moment that we pay attention to, or things that we recover from the long-term memory. So we're gonna talk about the working memory. So working memory is really the thing that we are thinking about at that moment. It is very limited. So the working memory can have up to seven elements at the same time, and seven element is a stretch. If you need to remember a phone number and then walk across a room, you'll most likely forget that phone number because that's 10 numbers. Phone numbers are not made for human brains. Usually we're gonna be around three or four elements. But if you're under a situation of stress or anxiety, then it's gonna be even lower. So remember those numbers, those numbers are important when you're prototyping. So what happens when you go above those number, you go inside cognitive overload. So cognitive overload is really uh, when you're in mental exhaustion because you have too many things to focus on. So this will occur when you're multitasking. So uh, multitasking is fake. It exists, but it is not good. When you're multitasking, what's happening is that you're using 100 of the process you would be using normally for all of those tasks, plus you're adding the mental process for switching between one or two. Oh, trick in real life. Uh, information overload, this is when you have too many information to focus on. Uh, poor time management, that, that's not really the reason why people will have issues with your prototype, but it might be one of the reasons you have issues in life. And uh, just complex tasks. Whatever you're asking your player to do is just so complex. So what happens when you do go in, in a cognitive overload? Well, you have difficulty concentrating, you have decreased performance, you're forgetting stuff, and generally speaking, you're feeling overwhelmed. So you see where I'm going with this? Basically, if you give this to your player and you say, here, try this game, no idea what's going on. So we have this box here. This is the enemy. This here is a barrel. This one here is an exploding barrel. So you give this to the player and already just starting, the player has four different elements they need to remember before they even try the game. That's before the controls, before they analyze how the enemy works, how they can move, what they need to do. So this is why we have sign and feedbacks. They allow you to give this information to the player so they can remove it from their head and just concentrate on what they need to do in order to feel the challenge of the game. So sign and feedback for prototyping. Here we have our nice exploding barrel ready for a game. Here we have the feedback of the exploding barrel also ready for a game. So I'm doing a prototype. This is my barrel. Even better, this is my barrel. So watch out with the color red you're gonna have a lot of red in your prototype. So if you can add different things, go ahead, do it. So if you're not as good as me at drawing and you feel that your, your explosion in a triangle wouldn't be as nice as this, this is not a pineapple, feel free to take one online. You're gonna scrap this prototype anyway, you might as well steal the art. This here is my explosion. So this explosion is great because not only does it feedback the fact that it did explode, but it also feedbacks the dimension of the explosion. So we know straight away, yes, the enemy got hit in there or the enemy did not get hit in there. You can put some transparency in there just to see if there were enemies in there. I mean, it's pretty, but my, my uh, Unreal skills were not good enough to perform this at that point. And my boyfriend that is an artist was not home. <laughs> So let's an example. This is my nice prototype. I'm prototyping a combat. Look at it. Oh. Amazing. Did you guys understand what happened? Yeah. <laughs> first of all, which one is the player? Which one is the enemy? So first thing we add, feedback. Usually speaking, when you're prototyping and you're not the one watching the prototype, you know which one is the player. You're it's character you're controlling. So we'll put it blue. The reason why you do want to have a color for your player is that afterwards you can associate 
this color of the player with other elements in your map and say, this is a player connected ability. So you use one of those icons you stole from the internet, you put it on a blue background and you know this is a power up. And then we put the enemy, I put them orange because as I said already, the color red can be dangerous. And obviously I'm gonna be using the color red later. So now we have this upgrade. So now we know that the player is the one who defeated the, the enemy. Good start. Next level. I don't remember what it is, so I'm gonna make it play. Oh, feedback. Now we know that you have actually attacked the, the enemy three times. We get feedback for it, but you also got attacked once. Last version. <laughs> Apparently the enemy was looking the other way, which is why it took so much time for him to get attacked. So you see in this case, maybe I want a prototype backstabbing and being able to know where the enemy is looking is really gonna help me with this. You can also go with arrows. Alexi likes arrows. You can just put an arrow showing where they're swimming. I personally like eyes. <laughs> so I put eyes on my character, makes them look cute. Last, last step. This one is optional, animation. You see my nice animation? That was low effort. <laughs> but having animation is important because animation takes time. And if you are doing a full combat with animation in there, you want to be able to plan for the time of that animation because you might figure out, oh yeah, my prototype is really fun. And then the moment you take it out of the game and you put your animation in there, suddenly it's not working anymore because you forgot that, oh, you need to charge up, you need the time, oh, when is my hit, et cetera, et cetera. So always think about animation. It might not be the time for you to add it in prototype, but think about it nonetheless. And that's it. All right. All right. Last presentation. So I, I've I've dropped the whole layout thing in power in PowerPoint. I just open it up, use what's there, and that's it. So yeah, sorry, sorry for that. Uh, however, I do stand behind everything that's been said about prototyping, and I realize that I I know all these rules, stand by them, break them all the time, to my detriment. I think I, I could do much better. But here's a, a few things more. So um, building on everything that's been said, uh, I want to just add something is prototyping. It's been pointed at. I think Alexi mentioned it, the idea of being quick and dirty. Uh, that, that really mentioned as well is it doesn't necessarily like the shortest path towards answering a question or exploring the thing that you want to answer is not always going into the editor or being technical. That's that's where you will have the finest answer, like the most quality, luxurious answer to your questions. But that's also what's the most expensive takes time, especially if you're a solo dev or small team. Every everything is is complicated. So there are other things to discuss like other boundary objects. I like I like that idea. Something to put it in front of you to talk with the material and see how it responds. So I, I, I looked through my own things and saw a whole spectrum of stuff that I made to prototype ideas. So first one, pro probably in the order of the cheapest to the most expensive maybe. Conceptual prototyping is something that I like as well because the idea is to get stuff out of your head. When it's in your head, it's perfect, it's so good, it works, it's fine. And then when you wanna land it, that's where things become complicated. And an easy way to land it is just flow charts or mind maps, you like that? I like this one too, good colors. So this, this is a messy one, but that's, that was a complicated idea. It had many ins and outs, I, had, I couldn't hold it in my head. And so I mapped it and then I started, it started making sense. But you can, you can iterate on that as you can iterate on any prototype. And at some point you can boil it down and that's, that's a workable diagram. And this one, it works. It's, it was actually prototyped as an idea. And then I could implement it as is. I knew it worked before starting to code because it's, all, it's there. I can follow the path and it makes sense. 
documents for the old timers. Uh, there was a time where, or you, where you were taught game design. There was this notion that you would write the game design document, the Bible, and all the knowledge would be in there, and then you would hand it off to the makers, and they would just make it, and that that worked. <laughs> It fell out of fashion pretty quickly, uh, but that doesn't mean documents are not useful because it's also cheap. It creates something to talk about, uh, but nowadays it's mostly considered as a living object. It's not a dead, all the knowledge is there, but the ideas are no longer in your head. They're down there. Oftentimes at the moment of writing, you discover the missing links and the problems, and then you can have someone read them and then discuss them and, all, and trace all the reasons why something was changed why something was considered, the, the, all the, the intentions, the questions, the, uh, the reasoning behind that, cheap, fast, uh, dynamic. Paper prototype, if you've read game design manuals, you've been told that this is a good thing to do. Any of you actually did it? Yes, Legos, good. So I, I did do it as well. This is uh, Pippin and I, the prototyping, also AI, but this time with chess pieces and trying to follow uh, instructions, seeing if our AI would work and what are the, what's the minimum essentially decision tree that we need for, for, for uh, chess pieces. Uh, cards, also useful thing, it's, it's so fast, you can erase them, add stuff uh, that works. But of course not every, I, every game project lends itself to paper prototypes. Uh, a platformer, it's hard, like it, you don't get the feel of it. The maquette, mock-ups, that's probably one of my favorites. I, as a professor here, putting on the professor wig, uh, I'm always very surprised that students don't do this before sitting down and coding. Oftentimes I, I talk to a student and I try to get them to talk about their idea and I can't even know what's on the screen. Like in your idea, what's there? What do I see? And so uh, we'll find out. No, I mean, it's so fast, just sketch it and, and I'll find out. So this is once again for that chess game, sketch it up. This is how I think it's gonna work. Uh, some, some things to talk about. It didn't end up looking like this, but we, we, we had reasons why. A more elaborate one for a project a bit, I mean, the prototype does, are not necessarily only at the beginning. It can be at every step, whenever you have some question or things you wonder. And in this case, I thought I had a clever idea. I, and when I look at the maquette here, I still like it, but I, I learned from it that it didn't work. My idea was that you would walk your path and you would it was a, a conversation and you would choose your next uh, item of conversation by walking towards it. So it would map out physically the conversation as a space. And like conceptually, it really made sense. And it was it's actually pretty sexy too. But I, I immediately realized this is going to be so slow. A conversation, especially a digital one, got to be fast. Like, I say this, you say this, I say this, you say this. But here's like walking towards the next thing. I knew, like I dropped it, I, the baby in the water. Go ahead. Sometimes uh, it, takes a lot, it takes a while. Here it's a project uh, that, that complicated. Like on the screen, I needed so much stuff. So it took, sometimes it takes a while. Some people here know this. So that was my first step. Then I asked the artist and the team, do it, but it's but nice. And then it was much nicer. But then I said, you know, here you have just a little box of text. I need tons of text. I need text everywhere. It's like you're eating up the whole real estate with the nice graphics that you made. So another one, another one, another one, four other ones. Uh, another one, and it, it, we didn't even use that one in the end, but this, this one worked for a little while. Sometimes you get it immediately. This is a pretty weird project that I'm working on right now. And I, it wasn't my mind, sat in front of Photoshop. I put it all there and I'm like, this works. I got to do it. I'm doing it. I'm taking this seriously. So my daughter had an idea for a game and she was trying to explain it to me and it was all very fuzzy and confusing. And so I said, draw it and we can talk about it. And she drew this, and then I could ask questions. What, what are these bars? So boundary objects. What are this, the rounds, like the circles there? What do they mean? What, what happens? And then I could get it. We got, I got it from this boundary object. And then I made the game. So it's a memory game, but with colors, essentially. And then I finally understood that the circles was where to remember which color you had finally uh, found. 
one of my favorites. Yes, do I, do I have friends? So if you're, if you're designing not more about interface, but systems, then building the system is complicated, but Excel can often get you pretty far to get a sense of how that system works in time. And that's a pretty good feedback. Like, like here are the graphs, this is a card game, but I wanna know these values, how will they change in time? How can I predict them? And like, are the curves in the right direction? Excel, thank you. Another one here, it's not, it's not as good looking, but it was in a, in a game I wanted to know, okay, what's the progression of all these stats over time that I can imagine before actually, like I can fiddle with these numbers and fudge them before I sit down and actually test them in the game. Another good question is, will it actually work? So in my, in my research, I often like to use new technologies or stuff that doesn't have, like we don't exactly know how they, how they work. And, and so there's a technical question, will it work? Like, does it work? That idea, does it work? So that's an ugly one, but it was for generative text. And we're like, eh, it works. Simulation, it's ugly here, but a simulation has many things happening all the time. And here I need feedback as well, because if you can run it in the black box, it just does stuff. And then what? So I had to visualize all those things and see if, if they actually worked. The chess game. Prototype for, for production. So that's also interesting one, especially if you have, I mean, all the all productions have uh, requirements in terms of how much energy can we put in there. So there was a game where I had this idea of how I'm gonna represent it. And so I tested out one scene and I was pretty happy with it, but it had taken me one full week of making it. And I knew I wanted a hundred of those to make the game work and that would not work. I, I didn't, I would never have the time to make this happen. So another baby in the water, it ended up looking like this. So no walking for conversations, no landscape, nothing, just plain old text. That's also a funky one is, and another question as a professor, students and me, myself also, landing ideas in concrete, you can skip the whole process and straight up before making everything, what will the game look like for onlookers? Like you could decide to just, that was an experiment we did, design the Steam page or the HIO page as the first step. And so you answer big questions, like what's attractive about it? What are the hooks of it? What's the style? How do you talk about it? And you answer many questions by, and it's pretty easy and quick, just what's the Steam page look like in two years when the game is done? For tools, that's also a funky one, but designing an idea, a big project is, is one thing, but at the, during production, you're working with content and a lot of it, even as a designer. So that's one thing I like to do if, if, if typically my projects require some weird content input. And so if before writing the code for the tool, I prototype the kind of inputs that I wanna send in that tool. So this is for the text generator I was talking about. Uh, it's a, yeah, I don't want to explain it, but in my mind, I was like, okay, if I'm going to write templates to do generative text, this is how I'm thinking. And, and by writing these fake inputs, these fake scripts, I could find out if I like doing that. And then once I was happy, we made the thing. And that's my favorite tool of all of the ones I made. Another more recent one, not sexy again, but prototyping JSON files. Opening up an editor and said, the content I want to write for this game will be through JSON files. And so I want to structure it. It took me three, four, five JSON files to figure out, oh, this is the syntax and now it works and I can make the next one fast. Make the tool after that. Okay, that's the funkiest one. How do you test a game that doesn't exist at all? There's nothing in it, but you still wanna test it. The, the Wizard of Oz method, actually a bona fide research method, is essentially playing a role-playing game where one person plays the game, non-existent game, and another person is the player. And you tell them, this is what you see. What do you want to do? Okay, I want to jump on the Goomba with the pointy head. You sure? Because you're dead now. And so the game doesn't exist, but you can try out your ideas. You see what the players want to do in those contexts. And you get all tons of feedback and cost you nothing. All right, so I'm going to, this is redundant, but what method to choose? The one will allow you to answer the questions fastest, but now I want to play contrarian. And there's also the other one, which is, especially if you're a student and you can afford it, the one that brings you the most joy <laughs> while you're doing it is also fun. But <laughs> all right, 
Okay, thanks. <laughs> like, this is it for me. Thank you. <laughs>
but we have the luxury in, in, in research and university. Although time boxing is, I think, something we should all do a little bit more because academic time is more elastic for the worse often. <laughs> it's also part of our uh, goal to, to find out stuff that we were not looking for necessarily. I don't have much to add to this, but one of the reasons why I would do iteration is really just sign in feedback. People don't understand it. <laughs> So maybe I need to add something. It, it is worth something, taking the time to make sure that your prototype isn't the issue before just flushing it away. Uh, but else than that, but yeah, I agree. Very good. Thank you all. Is there uh, someone else who's okay? Uh, hi. Uh, yeah, so my question was mostly about, so there was a lot of talk about using, uh, what was it called, boundary objects? Like testing prototypes of video games uh, using uh, pretty much anything you have on your hand to kind of have a quick and dirty solution, which is something that I, I really like doing as a person who likes to design and doesn't like to program. So that's fantastic for me. Uh, my only, um, I mean, the, the things that comes to mind is that I would assume that there is something still lost in translation if you are doing a prototype for something that is supposed to be a video game programming, you're testing it in, in a medium that is completely different from that. Um, so my main question would be, how do you tackle that as professional in the field? How do you decide which um, alternative medium for testing something uh, would be appropriate depending on your purposes. And uh, if you find out that that was the wrong choice, what do you do then? Like, how do you uh, solve that problem afterwards? Very I good. have the mic health start. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, the first thing is if you're testing out the feel of a game, how it feels to play, then actually doing it in an engine might be the best solution. If you're going with a system, and it's only rules and you don't need, only need information about what it's going to give you, then you your choice is a lot more open and it's easier to go in a lot of different things. Yeah. Yeah, just... <laughs> just from the professional perspective, I want to add something to that. So of course there's a caveat, anything that is it involves the game feel. So basically anything that is in the three C's realm, right? So characters, control, camera, cannot typically be tested. I mean, you could test cameras by being creative and kind of weird and indie, but you really probably will use the engine to test the three Cs. How do you tackle that if you can't? Because this actually the funny thing is the game feel is the, the hardest thing to do and it's the, the most expensive to get it right. And how do you prototype the thing that you cannot prototype because it takes the final version to know that you did it? You can't. So what you do then is very simple. You copy. Right? So you pick the game that does the thing that you want, specifically about the thing, the camera of this game, the, the controller feel of that game, and you go to the people you work with and you go, guys, this is my prototype. It costs $120 million. It's right here on the PS5. You can <laughs> play it. Are you able to reproduce this? How? What percentage of this are you able to reproduce within the scope of our game? And usually they don't like that question. They go like, I don't know, 50%, 30%. You go, great, let's do this. Because there's no other way to do it. So this is about game knowledge and about copying what's good and knowing why still, why do I want this thing here? Because this is the best version of this feeling I've ever seen. This should be or like the, you know, the light in the, in the night, but everything, the other 95%, there's no reason to, to not use shoes and role play and stuff. Yeah. All right. Um, I know we've talked a lot about quick and dirty, but there are some questions that cannot be answered with quick and dirty. And this is um, this is actually the thing that I hate to tell students because I mean, so frequently people get trapped into thinking, oh, let me make the real thing in one go. It's like, no, don't make the real thing in one go unless your question is related to technical infrastructure. Okay, if your question is related to technical infrastructure, then you will lose you will lose time to building that infrastructure to a high enough resolution that you're able to ask your question. Like there are some infrastructures that simply cannot be mocked up, but ask yourself, am I likely to want to continue exploring this infrastructural setup? And if that is the case, then it is worth investing the time to build that 
and but and but don't think about it as one prototype. Think about it as the materials to make many future prototypes. Yeah, it's a really good question because it's a really heartbreaker. Okay, because <laughs> countless times I've seen a project click on something that you would never really have prototyped for. Like this all feels stale and dry and boring, but now that you've added this little animation, whenever this happens, it becomes alive. And how would you have known, you know? So yeah, you gotta take some risks sometimes, uh, but yeah, I don't have a good answer to that. <laughs> Very good, thank you. Is there, uh, do, do we know if there's questions online? At the moment? Not at the moment. Is there any more questions in the audience? Their hand are hands. Fantastic. Let me see. No. Um, uh, a very classic question is about prototyping. How do you make bro your prototype stand up? Because from the other tips that I've seen, it's very um I would say cliche to make a weak, um, reasonable prototype. So how do I make it stand out then? Is it, does it have to come from the initial questions? Do I have to have like a million dollar questions? If I can't answer it, my game is automatically become the next trend. Uh, where does standing out happens in prototyping? Okay, just one thing about that is, I think probably my, my colleagues will agree is the prototype is, if for a specific audience, typically, like if myself, I want to know if this will work and therefore it doesn't need to stand out to myself because I'm paying attention to it. Uh, sometimes I suppose my colleagues, they need to present something to their colleagues. So then it has to stand out or at least capture the, the imagination of something else. If you're speaking of capturing the imagination or the, the attention of a wide public, then I would assume we're out of the prototype space probably at, at that point. We're more of a finished product. So, but you have, want to add something to that? What? So yeah, my, my answer to this is why would you want your prototype to stand out? Uh. <laughs> it basically, what are you trying to test? Cause there's a lot of reasons to prototype. And some of these are just, is this working? And unless this thing that you're trying to make work is the centerpiece, the innovation of your project. It doesn't matter if it stands out or, or not. It just needs to work, see if it fits, see if it's fun, uh, usually see if it fits with other things. So your prototype doesn't always need to stand out. Usually you want your game to stand out. And your game will not always stand out with game design. It may stand out with visual, universe, character, theme. You have, I'm going to say something horrible, but if you look at uh, Rockstar games, their game do not stand out in game design. Do their games stand out? Definitely. So if you, if you want to make a prototype and you want it to stand out, ask yourself why. And basically, if it's because you want innovation, then it's just going to stand out if it's fun and new. Um, you just reminded me of something really important. We didn't talk, I, I, I didn't I didn't have to mention it uh, before. So as a designer within a project, your client is not the player. And bear with me here. Of course you designed for the player. Of course. Come on, I didn't say that. You're, <laughs> but on your everyday grind, your client is not the gamer yet. It's someone inside the project a producer, your boss, like whatever it is, someone you need to present your stuff to. Like, as you know, as designers, 50% of the job is how you present the thing. It's unfortunate or not, but that's the reality of it, right? You need to make it stand out, I guess, right? There's some aspect of that. Okay, so first thing, you need to make sure people, when they look at something, they know what they're looking at. And I know this is like super obvious and you would be surprised and amazed and depressed at how many prototypes are looked at by people that they don't know what they're looking at. So they go to the, like the, the sprint review or something, they go like, so yeah, we did this thing about combat and then they see the thing and they go like, oh, well, this is weird. What is the guy thinking? They, they're not even given context, which is the most dangerous thing because they're gonna sink your work if they don't know what they're looking at. So you need to, I tell people, write it on the wall. 
prototype to show how the dude runs when he's being attacked. You write it on the wall in engine and you need to stand in front of the text to stand with the character on the teleporting pad that brings you to the actual prototype. You cannot go there without reading the sign. If someone is like, well, I don't understand. Why is the arrow not red? He's like, did you read the giant sign on the wall? So that's the first thing you need, you need to give context. And also second thing, really important, especially in, in this day and age where you have access to infinite high fidelity, you, you said this, high fidelity material, amazing data banks on Unreal, you can make fucking photorealistic thing of your choice. Always put the toilet texture on the wall. That is the gray with the lines. You have access to all the textures in the world. Don't use them in your prototype. People don't understand what they're looking at the same way they don't read emails. You put someone above, which is like 20,000 feet, 50,000 feet from your work. You show them something on Friday. They go like, oh, this is great. And they see like this super nice texture and this like mega scan rock on the floor. And they think they're looking at this thing. It's like, this is the game. It's amazing. You know, no, no, no. This is just an asset I used. And they're going to go like, isn't the rock a bit big? <laughs> and you're like, no, I mean, yeah. Maybe, I don't know, like that's the rock I found. Please, this is the prototype about how the guy fights the thing. Yeah, it's kind of weird because the shadow is kind of shit on the rock. And I am swear to God, this will be exactly how it goes. If you show, if this goes outside to a partner, to a client, it's even worse. Then you should not be allowed to own a keyboard and write if that's the way you treat your prototype towards the client. The client will sink you down because they don't have context. And they will come back and go like the artistic direction. I don't like the rocks. And then it becomes this whole thing. And you just wanted to have a prototype using mega scan assets because you're excited. Don't do it. You put everything bright pink. If it's not a thing, you put it bright pink. You write placeholder everywhere, like I did on the slide. And you put toilet texture on everything. And you use the, the beautiful art that we saw from Sophie's uh, expertise in Unreal. That's what you show people. They're, they're not going to comment on the visual, I swear. Sorry, I have. I want to be long. I had to rant about this. This is really, yeah, really good. I'm just going to add to this because this did happen to me. The nicer your mockups are, the nicer the things you put in the game, the more chance they have to actually ending up in the game yeah. or your programmers to think this is exactly what you want them, what you want it to look like. So make your art ugly. If you can't make your art ugly, write mockup on it. <laughs> really? This makes me think that we should probably just have a class at Concordia where we are churning out ugly assets for prototyping. Like a database of ugly assets. A database of ugly assets. Sounds great. I think there was a question online. I do have a question online uh, from Pippin Barr. Oh. And Pippin, I'm going to, Pippin can't uh, mic on for this, so I'm going to read it out. And my apologies if I don't get it quite right. Pippin says, I'm going to read the last part. Uh, oh, maybe, <clears throat> this is Pepin talking, maybe. What about prototyping without a question, exploratory prototyping used to understand your materials rather than to hit on a clear question or answer? Uh, Pepin says, I'm a big proponent of game design that's reactive to the materials to hand, such as primitives, physics, lighting systems. Where does that fit in this? Prototyping that's not targeting a player experience, but targeting designer knowledge. I think that, we'll start with that. There's a fire coming. I My apologies. <laughs> All right. For those of you who don't know, Pippin Barr is married to me. <laughs> okay. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take this one on. All right. <laughs> so if we're talking about responding to materials, then I would say that the question is in relation to those materials. So there is a question. It's just that perhaps you haven't articulated it yet. Maybe it is, what does this material want to do? OK, how does this material feel? How do these materials feel when I put them together? OK, what do I think when I experience these materials together? I think that probably those are the types of questions that you're asking. Um, and maybe you don't. Maybe you don't think of them as being particular enough that they need to be articulated. But I would say that every designer who's doing this type of material exploration is using those materials to bounce off their own thinking process 
Okay, it's a constant, it is a conversation with materials as the great Donald Schoen would have said. All right, for context, I'm also married to Pippin Bar. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't that you had polyamorous on your slide. There we go. We need to talk about this. Um, so hot take. I actually don't know Pippin Bar, so that's why I'm I'm saying these things. If he was here, I, I wouldn't say that. Maybe you're just lazy. Let me explain. I need to explain. No, no. So, but if so, the thing is this: maybe you don't think you need a question. Maybe you don't have a question. But if you're prototyping, it means you're looking for something. If you're looking for something, it means there's a vision, there's a single image, there's a single word, there's a sentence, there's a poem. I don't care what it is. There's something that was at the origin of whatever it is you're doing now. Otherwise, it, you're just fiddling with stuff, which I wouldn't call prototyping. You like Legos? You can play with Legos. That's fine. But if you're prototyping, it means there's something that was the spark at the start of it all. And I think if you don't have a question, it's, that's why I said you're just being lazy for not formulating it. And maybe you don't want to, um, you know, you don't want to sort of cluster yourself in a question and be the slave to the question. Yeah, just ask the question and then change it. It's fine. Trash it. Ask eight questions. But for me, it's like aimless wondering. Well, I mean, in the case of um, maybe academics do that. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, aimless wondering for academics is great. I would love to do it. No, no, but I, I think in most cases, you're, you, you can't really afford to do that. So I expect that the question will, if you don't have it, it will come to you. Otherwise, like for me, it's really dangerous. And I mean, in design in general, just not prototyping, but people coming up with, so the, the risk is this, people shortcut, designers shortcut. You tell them about an idea, they tell you how it works. You all do this here, I'm sure. You're all guilty of this. You, you start getting excited and then you go like, oh, what if the guy has plus one on fire? And then when he moves too quick, right? You do this like sh straight away, directly first thing. And you forget like why, like forget the whole process. For me, it's the same danger. If you don't ask yourself the question, you're you're going to shortcut yourself into the, the, the minutia and the detail. And um, you shouldn't. I'm sorry, Pippin. He's, he's answering. He's like trashing on this on the chat. I'm not reading you, Pippin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you should. You should. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I invite everyone to read Pippin, Pippin Barr's recent book, The Stuff That Games Are Made Out Of, which is exactly him doing that, fiddling with the stuff that games are made out of. And I mean, he knows how to do this. But I think Pippin, he, he has questions, but maybe not as clearly defined. Uh, but he's an expert, actually, at figuring out stuff and posing questions to the material. But I want to take this conversation maybe one step up in general, general, generality. Uh, game designers. So there's this assumption that making games is a design process. It often is. Probably in, in an industry context, it, it has to be or it should be for efficiency, but also making it work quickly and at predictability. Not always the case. But games are also made with an artist hat, uh, and that's a different kind. In this case, is it still prototyping? I don't know. I think artists and designers, they're the same people, but maybe it's just they, they view things differently. Uh, they do have questions. They don't necessarily frame them clearly, but they have, as you said, they have something on their mind. You have something on your mind. You're, you don't go at this just, oh, I don't have anything to do, I'll just... No, you're like, what if, or I'd like to, and then find out what happens. So th there's a difference in the processes here, but that are, that are valuable. And it's it's good if you have the luxury to also approach things this way. Yeah, the question I see there is, how do you call this process? I would just call it having fun. <laughs> Basically, if you're not answering a question, you're not really prototyping, you're just having fun with your thoughts, which is, I mean, great. As a designer, it's fun to just think of ideas and oh, what if, what if, what if, and it's it's important to do. It's important to explore those things, but yeah, before that, it's just fun. research. Research, yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, do we have more we questions? Do. Oh, we do. We have a question Fantastic. over here. Hi, this question is for Rilla specifically <laughs> because you mentioned your three wigs. 
<laughs> designer, researcher, and uh, professor. And I'm just wondering, I'm going to guess that maybe all those three wigs don't go along in happy harmony all the time. So if you're prototyping, uh, are there times when they come into conflict, you know, how you would approach something or carry something out? And then how do you decide who wins? What a deep cut question. <laughs> you, you, for those of you who have been watching carefully, I specifically chose not to talk about being a designer. <laughs> the reason being that when I'm being a designer, I'm terrible at documenting what I do. When I'm being a researcher, though, I'm very good at documenting what I do. Okay, so I do also understand what Pippin's trying to get at there when he asks, what do you call the process of making something to find the question? Because I do also believe that there's a type of flow state that we get into when we're creating. And that flow state does not necessarily involve us being able to put words around what we're trying to do. Right? If we're just in it, we are probably feeling. And for designer me, that's that's great. For researcher me, that's really not good enough. So in terms of how my wigs clash with each other, do I layer them on top of each other? <laughs> Am I wearing a wig under a wig under a wig? Well, maybe I swap the order of them sometimes. Um, as a professor, I try and express all facets of that. I both try and capture what it is to design and how we should be designing and what best practice is. But designer me and researcher me, we are often at odds with each other. Does anyone want to also answer the question? Yeah, I don't even pretend that I can document well my work when I this is I have dropped it. <laughs> but I'm I'm curious though on that question for to my colleagues, do you keep good track and journaling and you know keeping documents of where you were at at every given point and why you did this instead of that, or is it just like a tunnel of action that eventually goes somewhere? Well, I like documentation. I like writing documentation. So I have a nice Miro board at work, which has all of the version that got rejected. <laughs> but I like that. I'm not the only one on my team and all of the people on my team don't necessarily do that. Uh, I have uh, come into conflict with people that forget the decisions, whether they are designers, uh, creative directors, programmers, clients. Uh, so yes, I have found that uh, writing down your conclusion and keeping them and just saying, okay, this was the conclusion, then we switch to this for this reason, whatever the reason. When you're in conception, changing direction is okay. When you're in production, it is not as okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, so I tend to document my things. Uh, my documentation is all over the place and it is absolutely not ordered. I have to go through it and say, okay, yeah, this was before this. Why is this on this side? Uh, I've, I've added category, rejected ideas and shown, okay, no, this goes and rejected now, even though it was shown. Uh, but yeah, I have no problems with documentation. Can you give it to us? <laughs> Can you share it? <laughs> um, and actually something I would sort of recommend for anyone, whether you're uh, working on a student project or in a big company, I think it's the same process. Like usually I like when we're in conception phase, it's more open and we're asking these broad questions. We have to ask questions. Um, and then usually I like to have a weekly objective. So I would state out like this week, we're trying to figure out X and I check in every two days because I figured that two days is enough for, not if I'm doing the prototyping, that, that's different. But let's say I'm actually doing an engine prototyping with the help of someone who's actually good with the engine. I tell them I will check in every two days. 
And then we can change direction. We can even change the question if we're really confident. So there's like a weekly objective and two days check-in. And I only document like in a whatever tool you have, doesn't matter, a paper or Jira for us, which is like a big tracking thing. And like on the Tuesday, we said more blue and larger barrel. And then on the, on the Thursday, this is amazing, more barrels. And on the Friday, question answered or not. And then you have this just tracked with simple one-liners that you can always come come back and, and look to. So you don't need to sort of actually archive everything from every build and every gym that was built because this is mental, but at least you have a, a simple tracking and you keep poking the question every two days. You come and like a body, is it dead? And you poke with the stick, no, it's fine, it's going fine. Okay, see you in two days. And you let them run for two days. That's the way I like to, to do it. That's like we're getting closer to five. Is that, yeah. do we still have time for another one or is that... Uh... That'd be it. There's, there, there's one. I, I see a microphone coming. Hello. Hi. Um. Firstly, thank you so much for your insights and your presentations. It was all lovely. I'm like over here. Hi. <laughs> I'll wave a hand. Um. So quick and dirty. I kind of wanted to sit with that a little bit because, as I mentioned it a lot, and. Uh, as a person who's just kind of starting to like for for my research, like doing research creation projects and thinking about prototyping, quick and dirty as a concept for me is very difficult to like know what those limits and what those boundaries are. So I guess kind of my 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 question would sort of be like, when is it no longer quick and dirty? When is that at risk of becoming like a little bit too much, and then you need to find a new direction, or like you're taking too much on, and it's not really a prototype anymore. It's something like far too big you need to like scrap it like when do you throw the baby in the water and then you like do something else it's more it's more that kind of thought process yeah i'm sure my my colleagues have a, 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 something to say i'll say just one thing one of the signs to me is uh, diminishing returns because at the beginning every step yields a lot you're like oh I like that. Oh, yeah. No, no. And then at some point, you spend one full day, and it just adds a little bit of new information. And then you're feeling that every effort now is more costly and yielding less. So this is, to me, a sign that like the, the water is calling. So one of the big question is, if you're adding to make it pretty, it's too far. You don't need that. Uh, usually you'll have that problem if your your prototype is giving you a negative answer. If you have your positive answer and you know, okay, yeah, this is the answer I need for this, this works and this, this is going in the direction I want, then you're going to be fine saying I'm done with this. And it's really when you're going in the negative answer and this is not giving me the result I wanted, how do I change it to give me the result I wanted? This is when you need to start wondering, asking yourself, do I go further or not? At one point, you need to accept that it's not working. Right in our um in my research group for games as research, one thing we've started doing is we've been trying to come up with techniques to ask ourselves as we are making. Okay, so one of those is uh, relates to reflection. When you make a prototype, ask yourself, like after you've tested it, ask yourself what, okay, what happened? Or what do I care about this prototype specifically? And followed by what, ask, so what? Okay, why is that important? And then ask yourself, now what? Okay, if you ask yourself those three questions periodically, that should tell you, it should give you enough information to know whether or not you should keep going. Okay, so that would be another way, that would be another uh, heuristic that I would throw out there is ask yourself those three questions, ask them periodically, ask them frequently. And also like, and simply, if you are now too wedded to your prototype, that if your hard drive died and it was gone and you were devastated, okay, then you've invested too much time in your prototype. <laughs> <laughs> too late. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Like if, if the baby goes in the water, do you, if you feel fine, then you're, you're doing good. 
What if it starts swimming? Oh, 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 let's, let's, let's put that baby to rest. Um, concerning the first part of, of your question, um, it goes back to what I was uh, hinting at earlier, and it's it's a super simple and dumb question is, I'm trying to find out something. What is my what is the quickest way I can do it? So there's no answer. Like I, I'll, I'll give you a, a kind of, I mean, almost good example. I'm quicker working in Illustrator, you know, the program than most other programs for no good reason. I wasn't trained, but I just use it a lot to make fake stuff. So I'm really quick with Illustrator. So if I need to test stuff out in system, I'm going to open Illustrator and work in it. And it's not something I would advise people to do. It's a dumb thing to do, but I'm faster in it. If I was faster with like post-its and napkins, I would use that. Um, unless I know that I can't answer the question with those means. But I mean, if you are you have a variety of means, there's no good answer. Just what is the quick, quickest route? And then you'll know if the fidelity of that means is not good enough. You'll know. You'll go like, ah, yeah, I'm not really getting the answer. Maybe I need to upgrade to like, you know, colored post-its. Because right now the single, the yellow post-its are not cutting it. But you will know. So you need to try it. Like what's the cheapest, dirtiest, scrappiest I could do? And then you improve only if you need to. And you stop before it's pretty. That's for sure. Like that. We all agree on that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Start with the cheapest and augment only if needed. <laughs> I, there's a question on here that I think is really good. How do I formulate my initial question so that I'm able to answer it with a prototype? I think that's probably the hardest thing. That's, I mean, when, when learning to become a designer and researcher, that's it's often the same problem. How do we formulate a good question? I don't, I don't know. I don't have good answers, but you'll know that you have a good answer. One of the heuristic, I like that word as well. You know that you have a good question if the prototype that would answer it comes to your mind relatively simply. Because if you're, as, as Alexis said, if you're looking for fun, then you're like, where do I start? You know, there are so many fun things, so many boring things. But if you're like, can it be fun to play around with like AI prompting or whatever to do the, to do a PowerPoint. I'm like, yeah, I know I'm going to try this out. I, I have, I have the next step. I have the, so what? So that would be a good, I don't know how to get the question, but this is how one way to identify it. Just to do that too. Good questions. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say uh, practice makes perfect. Yeah. <laughs> You do it and eventually you know that's not good and then you get experience and you know better. Like there, there's a question about too broad of a scope. Same thing with scoping. I don't expect my juniors to be able to scope. That's why we have people scoping for them. Do it, scope it out, and eventually you'll be able to do it a lot more easily. All right, I'm just going to reread the end of that question. And when does my question become too broad to scope and answer in a prototype? The thing with design questions is that usually they're getting narrower over time. They're not getting bigger over time. So you're much more likely to have a question that is too big at the beginning. But then ask yourself, how would I, what would I need to be able to test this question? Okay, ask yourself, what would I need to build and how much time would that take? And if it would take you too much time, then your question is too big. Very good. It is a little after five, so I think we're going to have the call of the day. Um, right, right, right. Yeah, all right. So, okay. You want right. to give a few words? Not all right. really, maybe just calling the... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um... Merci beaucoup pour votre attention. Thanks for showing up. That was actually at least. Hey. <laughs> I'm not talking to the, I'm talking to you guys, not the, the people online. So, sorry, Pippin. Hi, Pippin. <laughs> uh, thanks for showing up. This was really cool conversation. Really enjoyed the, this talk with my colleagues. Hopefully it was useful, interesting to you. And uh, we'd like to do this again. Pretty cool. So hopefully we can organize another thing like that. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. And we I mean, can talk to us if you have any follow up questions right now. Bye bye. Thank you. One last thank you to Fourth Space who hosted us and organized all the technicals. That's really, really good, useful.
Yes, thank you everyone for coming in for the for space today for this conversation. All of you online, all in the space, thank you for all your questions. Also, we're going to be closing up the Zoom and the live stream now, but just a reminder that this conversation is already available on our YouTube channel. If you'd like to revisit it there, uh, please join us again and have a good evening. Thank you.